Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so this is exciting, and I'm and I'm glad we were able to do this so quickly. And we we've talked a lot. Um, but first, let me address the folks at home. This is transparent mastering, and this is part two, but it's the better part. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, what's a good sequel? Terminator 2. Mm, is it? <laughs> oh, it's way better than Terminator 1. Okay. And then the rest are okay. terrible, so I better not build another studio. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't know. I was thinking Mighty Ducks 2, but I don't know. Hmm. We're gonna have to cut this. Um, <laughs> I'll overdub a good sequel. I know that there's one. There's like a notoriously good sequel. Or maybe we should talk about sophomore records. Yeah, That's or more... like Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. Not much of a Star Wars guy. Transparent Mastering, the, the second video, and, and it's exciting because I knew that you were looking for a place. In fact, when we were last mm -hmm. at your studio, you were telling me about you wanted to find a place. It all happened so fast. Because it did, I, yeah. It was last summer, right? Yeah. That we filmed that? Yeah, I think it was so in like May, late May, yeah. Good for you. So do check out, and I, maybe I will pr pr uh, provide a link below, but I don't, I always forget to do that stuff, but whatever. Um, it's scrolling across the bottom here. But the first video, we talk about a lot of the gear that we're gonna skip over today, and there's some insane gear that um, we'll show. And we talk about how you got into this and the whole idea about mastering. And so we'll go back to that and, and you can see that video because there's so much we wanna talk about. I wanna talk about these incredible speakers. I, I assume they're a speaker unless they start like vacuuming and talking to me. And then I want to talk about the, the build. And then there's a couple of pieces of gear that you've got new mm -hmm. that I want to talk about. Um, so with the last we talked, you were working out of your living room. You had this little mobile rig and you were running off of these incredibly expensive AKG headphones. Yeah. And, um, and then you got this place. So real quick, can you tell us about this place and about the build of this room? Uh, yeah, so just so happened that we were able to get a house that had a nice spot mm -hmm. for me to build. Yeah, And, um, and this I, is attached, detached from the house. Yes, right, where, yeah. Uh, Jay, I don't know if we can get like a B-roll later, like tomorrow or, so, or another day of the shot of the house. I mean, right now the folks are actually seeing that B-roll. So but. that way we can show everyone exactly how Oh, that's in. good, yeah. Get yeah, come here and Get steal right. all this stuff. <laughs> okay, let me describe <laughs> it to you then. It is a very nondescript uh, uh, workshop off of a garage in the back of your house at an undisclosed location. In an yeah. undisclosed province. <laughs> <laughs> and I will you guess the country. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Okay, so you found this place. Go on. Yeah, so um, I've been planning on building a nice room for a mm -hmm. while, and my my dad is actually really into acoustics too. He's oh, might nice. be even more of a nerd than I am. Oh, yeah. So um, he had just last year built himself a garage with the purpose of like having a jam space that he could open up and perform with his jamming buddies to like oh, the small awesome. town that he lives in. No way. Yeah, so he actually built and like designed and built his room, and it worked out well. Yeah. And then uh, so we started talking about my mastering studio, and we took like a couple of months planning out stuff. Yeah. But it's not until you actually find the space that you got to actually right. work in it, right? right. Yeah. So uh, we were, like it's traditional to kind of go in the end, like in the, like a yeah. lengthwise so room. What are the, what's the size? I'm going to interrupt you a lot because that's, that's what totally I do. totally fine. But um, what is the size of this? What are we talking about uh, right now? Originally. Like, uh, originally it's nine and a half feet by 16 and a half feet. Okay. So, and what was the height? Uh, that's pretty much it. Like what that, the ceiling's okay. about an inch down. Yeah. So, and for the folks at home, just to give you a reference, I'm about six and a half feet. Yeah, it's like so. seven and a half feet tall. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, wow, I'm taller than I thought too. <laughs> yeah. uh, they can't check that on YouTube. Um, okay, so you originally, it was like you, you do the, the lengthways, right? Like you would put yourself yeah. here and then yeah. put a couch or something back there. Yeah, and the idea was to have like clients attending or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a nice friendly space. So why not? Um, well, uh, I wanted everything to be symmetrical for yeah. the imaging and right. uh, just right. the simplicity of the build. Yeah. And there was actually a chimney in the back corner that was uh, terribly inconvenient because right. it's part of the structure. Like yeah. it shouldn't have been, but it was. Oh, shoot. So uh, instead of doing that, we realized that I kind of wanted to build uh, base traps in the corner anyways. Right. So that was a way to kind of like do that. And uh, the shape that we built around that was nice here as well. And uh, yeah, so anyways, just the whole ergonomics of the room made a lot more sense widthwise than lengthwise. So you came in here, concrete floor, yeah, cinder block wall, yeah, and so tell our folks at home. And I and I said this to Crispin, who who built Crispin Day out in at the cabin in Toronto, who built a unit like this. And we have friends, Glenn and, and Eric, who did this. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think a lot of people, a lot of people have these little uh, shacks in, in their, on their property and want to know what it takes to build a studio. So tell me from cinder block to here, what, what do you have? So uh, on the cinder block, we put, um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a, it's a form of insulation. It's like bubble wrap, double layer okay. bubble wrap with foil on okay. it. It's got an R value of about eight and it's also vapor barrier. Okay. Um, and then I wanted to do, as you can see, everything's kind of flush mount here yeah. instead of like drywalling the walls right. okay. and then I sticking did. something on afterwards. And, all, and you lose a bit of space. You lose space. It's already kind of small. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing too Jeez. is all, all the broadband absorbers you buy are basically just rigid rocks I'll put in with cloth over it in a frame. Right. And it's like, that's what I'm putting in my walls anyways. Right. So why don't I just not put drywall on it? And yeah. there we go. That's, that is really smart. You yeah. pay him for that. Yeah. <laughs> that is really smart. Okay. So sorry, you continue and I'll ask some more questions. Yeah. So um, there's three, no, there's four things going on here. Okay. Um, the broadband absorbers are just black felt over top of the Roxel. Okay. This, and that's, there's Roxel on the other side? Yeah, of this? that is, you're feeling rigid Roxel through the oh, felt. Oh, what's the difference between rigid Roxel and, and like safe and sound insulation? Um, it's basically just thinner for the acoustic. Oh, kind of property, but it has the same. Yeah, effect. yeah, because the, oh. the the airspace between the actual filaments of the fiberglass or the the rock wool, whatever it is, yeah. is like uh, less important than the air actually moving the fibers. Oh, so okay. up to a certain point, you can compress it, and it still has about the same action. Okay, and then at some point, as soon as they start actually touching each other over a certain amount of its length, it'll okay. stop working. So. so and and how many layers of that you have? That's just two inches. Just two inches. Yeah, but and it's how do they all sell around. That? What's that? How do they sell that? Like, where do you buy that from? Um, I just got it from Home Depot, and it was like. And is it they sell them in sheets, like, or yeah, is like it in the six, bag? It's it's like six, and it's like a basically like a rectangle box, and you just cut it open, and they're like boards. Wow, yeah, that's I really easy to that. work with. And and that's like, are they much more expensive than Safe and Sound, like in the big? Yellow bat, pink bags, or um, it's a bit more. A bit uh, more. I think it worked out to being like eight dollars for a two by four sheet. Oh, wow. that's so, great. Yeah. Okay, so we have the you had the vapor barrier, and then sorry, what was after the vapor barrier? Just the Roxel. So for people who are into like construction, they're gonna so go a like a couple inches, and there's and there's cinder blocks. Yeah. That's right. Wow. Yeah, people that are in construction would be like, oh, your vapor barrier is in the wrong spot because it should be on like the inside, right? Right. But there's also not a lot of humidity and moisture being created in here. Okay. And so I was just like, you know what? I'm not having baths in here. I'm not cooking in here. <laughs> I'm not living in here. It's probably not going to be a big deal. So you're not doing it right. Yeah. If you're not having a, a but, bath while. Yeah, mastering. exactly. Oh, bath time mastering. That's the next one. <laughs> that would look good over here. <laughs> yeah. A claw foot right in the middle <laughs> while you get electrocuted yourself. Yeah, exactly. Um, wow, that is really okay. And so then this is what is this felt? Yeah. And where'd you get this from? Uh, just the fabric mart on Ottawa Street because there's like 20 of them. So you I know, just literally walked down Ottawa Street and I was like, I want black felt. That's true. We don't You're have You're giving any. away what, what, what city we're in now. Oh, so yeah. Now they're going to find us. Yeah. They're going <laughs> to geotag this video. And, um, I'm asking a lot of like, and I, I forgive me, but like I'm asking a lot of like very direct questions because. Um, it's just surprising. It's just surprising how kind of simple it is. Mm -hmm. Like I know it was probably a big mm -hmm. undertaking. And then, so this is drywall. Yeah. Any kind of special drywall? Or no. Just regular drywall. Just regular drywall. And then the, there are studs. Are the studs into the cinder blocks? Uh, the studs are mounted on steel track, but it's wood studs. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's just for okay. simplicity of building stuff. Okay. Well, that keeping them flush is really cool. Tell me about this. And I know our resident Jillard gu Guitars CRC, or is, it, is that right? CTC. C CRC machine. CNC. 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 Yeah. Church. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, talk to me about this board, because I know our, our buddy Jay here made this for you, but go on. Yeah, so this is a binary diffuser. Okay. And the way binary diffusers work, well, I don't know if we want to get right into that, but um, if you imagine... If you when can, else? Yeah. When else are we going to, man? <laughs> That's right. So the sound, when the sound comes in, if you imagine it as like a round wave, yeah. and it bounces off a perfectly flat surface, yeah. it basically comes off as a mirror image of that wave, right? Okay. So if it, if it hits this, and there's these spots that are absorptive, yeah. each one of these distances will actually create its own semicircle okay. bouncing off there. So if you have a random pattern, yeah. now you have like a random dispersion of semicircles, wow. right? So this this is really like, it's good because it's it's very compact. Okay. If you get those, uh, like the Skyline diffusers, uh, to get 
reach down far, you have to have them sticking out further and further from oh, the wall. Okay. This only goes down to about uh, like one kilohertz. Okay. It's only effective until there, and then the okay. wavelengths just get too small, doesn't do anything. Sure. But I mean, all your imaging, your stereo field and everything, right. like largely is about yeah. one yeah, k yeah. anyway. So. so what's behind this? And that's just more Roxel. So this is like, okay. this is, has a two inch layer of rigid Roxel. And this is what, plywood? Yeah, this is quarter inch plywood. Oh. And then behind that, it's just filled with insulation for like base trapping and stuff. And so what's the difference between, why would you do this versus this? <clears throat> well, that's, that's to just absorb all the early, reflect okay. yeah, early reflections. This one, I'm not going to get any early reflections at my seat. Okay. So this is all, all the mids that are hitting this wall. I just don't, I want it to be like a diffuse sound and okay. not like coming and bouncing a bunch of other times in the room. So what would happen if it was, if it was this, just rigid rocks? Um, it w the room would be more dead, oh, and it was too dead. Uh, so before I put this panel on, it was basically absorptive, yeah. and the room was too dead. So you, it's true. It's not that dead right now. Yeah, you don't want to make it too dead. Most yeah. speakers are not yeah. designed to be in a perfectly dead room, right? Okay. So okay. instead of having reflections that could cause problems, we yeah. have the liveliness of a reflection without the, the problems of like creating modes as much as you would. And and Jay, I don't know if you want to get on camera here, but we don't have another cameraman. But how did you make this? Well, um, you want me to hold the camera for you? Gosh, here, let's do this. <laughs> let's do this, folks. Do I need your mic? Okay, Jay, uh, well, how did you make this, and how did you make it random? Um, so John sent me like a basically a bunch of zeros and ones in a spreadsheet, and uh, so each zero represented a hole, each one represented a blank space. Um, I plotted that out in RhinoCAD, which is like a, a computer aided design program. Um, and then from there, I put the panel on my CNC machine, which is computer numerical control. It's a big, flat robot that holds a router bit. Um, milled out all those circles in a random pattern. And then I came in and we decided to add his logo into here. Yeah. It was more like, Jay was like, so what else are we doing with this? Yeah. This isn't interesting enough. This project's too boring. <laughs> yeah. That's too weird. Uh, so we did both of these, and then uh, we also did the two panels at the back, which are different things. So these are random diffusions, and that is something else that I'm sure you'll talk about. Yes, okay. we will. We will talk about that. You did I'm great. Probably out of focus. I you did. Guess. Yeah, you could have been. I don't know. I don't know how, how do you look at that staring down? So Absolutely. did you? You said you said he said you sent him ones and zeros. Did you design this? Randomly? No, that was that was kind of like a well accepted kind of like open source version of okay. this. But okay. the the real thing is, it's just you could put them in any any random number generator because yeah. it's the randomness that's important. Right. Um, what the reason why people like this pattern specifically is even if you do random, you could still have like 30 zeros in a row. Okay. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, here's one that actually looks random. Right, right. And when he, when Jay put it in, I gave him like, a, I think it was like 150 of the ones and zeros. Yeah. And then it only went so far and they started repeating and it, and it became obvious that it was repeating. Oh. And so we weren't sure what to do. And I was like, dude, random is random. I'm like, just anytime you see pattern, just destroy it. And then he did. <laughs> it worked out great. <laughs> that looks awesome. So how would you, now I'm starting to ask questions for um, myself, but how would you, how would somebody like do this in their studio if they don't have the privilege of like doing it flush? Um, like you, well, you could do you could do this with uh, an absorption panel. Okay, how because, would you do that? That's yeah, so say say you just did the same thing as I did with like two inches of Roxel. Yeah. You put a frame around it, and oh, then okay. you then you get this. So this is um this is like three quarter inch grid okay. with a half inch hole. Okay. I believe, and um, yeah, I think that's what we used. But anyways, uh, it, you could. If you wanted them all to be the same or whatever, you could plot it out once with a grid, yeah. with pencil, yeah. and then just mark which ones you want holes, and then just literally, dr you could clamp all the sheets together that you want to make right. into that and just drill through all of them at once. Wow. Right, and you just gotta be really careful and really steady. Yeah. Before Jay told me his CNC was running, yeah. there, I was like looking at these drill bit attachments you could put on something to make sure you're like drilling oh, straight right. in. Right, right, And that was gonna be like 100 bucks just to buy that tool for like six sheets of plywood. Is this one <laughs> the same as that one? Yes, but, they're, but they are flipped. So, so okay. they're not, they're not, they the don't random need, pattern. They don't need to be identical? They're, no, because okay. random is still better. Okay. But we still only did one pattern, but they're just rotated 180 degrees. So now it is different. Even though random is better, you still wouldn't want it to be the same because it's stereo. You know what? I really think that we're talking about like a millionth of a percent difference at this point. <laughs> I'm just true. being honest. <laughs> you know, it's a good point because we were talking about my music, which is like, you know, more like lo-fi and experimental mm -hmm. and, and, and you you want it to be 
you don't want it to be like perfect. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. I know what you mean. Well, this is really cool. And so we got a bass trap here. Yep. And, and so what goes into a bass trap then? So what's behind here? Um, that is just uh, like four sheets of Roxel and then an airspace behind it. How much of an airspace? Uh, I, th I think there's 10 inches. So airspace. four sheets of Roxel. Yeah. So you're, you're talking eight inches of Roxel. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then it must be. It, is it eight inches? Then behind it to the did corner. Did you did you have to cut them a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it makes them you yeah. made them narrower. Yeah. Okay. You could just use a knife for that. And then there's uh, air space. Is is this important that you can? There's air here, or is that? Uh, just... Yeah. The air space actually does help. Um, help the absorption. So you wouldn't want to go Roxel right to the back? Yeah, you could, but it'd be pointless. So actually for a lot of base oh. trapping stuff and even just other absorption yeah. things, like say you put um, a, just a, an absorber right on the wall, if yeah. you actually move it out like a quarter or a half inch, it actually increases the efficiency a lot. Oh my and the gosh. reason is because you're using, you're you're working on like the, the movement of the air itself. Okay. And if you imagine like a ball hitting a wall, yeah. the velocity of of anything when it hits a reflection surface is zero. So at the wall, it's zero. Okay. So anything you have right on the wall isn't doing anything. Right. And if you move it out, now it's like actually hitting like air molecules that are actually moving, wow. right? And the, the reason why base traps are so popular in the corner is because um, this will actually kind of deflect the, the wave a bit okay. and help it like not, because you get the, the waves canceling out on each other. Right. So when it hits a surface and it deflects a little bit, now it's not the exact dimension of this. It actually changed the distance of it. Wow. And as you, if you think, if you're going into a corner and you, you're diffracting these things at weird angles, you have an infinite variation of distances right. in going into right. that corner, right. right? So like it goes this one, the next one goes there, this one right. goes there. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So you're really screwing it up, but. Yeah, that is yeah. really cool. And that's really simple too. I didn't realize it was so simple. That's very cool. And what about the ceiling? Was there anything uh, unique that you did with the ceiling? No, just, no. just the drop ceiling. Okay. I had visions of doing things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this was kind of like the, let's do this treatment. Right. And then whatever lingering problems there, I'm actually gonna address with the ceiling. Oh, I see. Um, so some of that stuff was pending, you yeah. know, like the rooms, no room's really perfect. Sure. It's actually fairly close. Like it's within five dB, which is like a lot better than I thought. That's awesome. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna fix these problems by like seeing that up there. Or maybe I'll design one to go in the ceiling tile, yeah. Yeah. right? And all that stuff. And then I just worked in here for a while and I was like, yeah, yeah. I no, have a pretty smart. good handle on what's that's happening smart. in here. So I might do it eventually, but I'm what is the, really What is busy. this floor here? Um, it's just subfloor, okay. like a wooden subfloor. So what's underneath? You have the, like the, the subfloor with the bubbles kind of thing. Uh, it's just concrete and then vapor barrier, and then we just level the subfloor. Oh, okay. And we were wondering, um, my dad and I were wondering when we built it if uh, there's going to be like resonance in the floor. Yeah. And the solution to that was super easy. Was just going to be like drill holes in between the supports and just fill it with spray foam. Oh wow! But then it didn't. So yeah, it didn't, yeah, it didn't end up being a problem. No, that's great. It it, it looks really cool in here, and, and we talked a little bit off camera about how important the, for me the the symmetry is. Mm -hmm. And you know, mastering slightly. I mean, you might argue with this, but slightly a less creative role yeah, than totally. the other parts of music. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think for it to be symmetrical, the way everything is laid out, like this is really the most technical a song gets in the phase mm -hmm. and, I, and i like how scientific you have things and oh thanks spaceship like yeah. you have things in there. <laughs> we're going to dive in a little bit more yeah. but i want to talk about the speakers are we still okay jay uh you're not sh shooken up for over that uh that little on camera incident um so this speaker here my I don't know if I messaged message you this. My cousin, who's a mastering engineer down at um, south of Nashville, uh, just showed me. He was like going to get the big barefoots, and then he was like going for the Amphians, and then all of a sudden he got a pair of these. Not these. I think the model below, which is a little bit taller. Oh, okay. Um, but anyhow, uh, that when he saw when he showed me a picture of them, I thought. It was ridiculous. I yeah. thought it was like something that <laughs> Prince would have in his studio. Um, but uh, tell me about these. How did you find out about them? Who are they? Um, so Tyler Acoustics uh, and Ty Lashbrook is his name. Okay. And he's like just about the most down to earth 
guy, like you call him up on the phone, let's have a chat, you yeah. know, he's a great guy. And um, he's really open about his speaker design. If you want to, like all, everything's built to order. Okay. So it's kind of custom, like this is a standard design, but you get the wood and veneer all and the color and everything oh, okay. as oh, for what cool. you want. That's cool. And uh, he'll also, he's got a guy that designs the crossovers and you can actually talk to him. If you like your speakers brighter, you can talk to him and he'll actually do some tweaks for you. So it's, oh, wow. and he's like, he's done, there's a bunch of mastering studios that have Tyler's now. And so he's like pretty familiar with get, what guys want. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I called him up and we talked about it. We decided this is about the right size for the room that I was getting. Oh, okay. And, um, yeah, so they go down to 26 hertz, which is pretty impressive. Wow. Um, and then, uh, and like flat to 26 hertz. So I might get down right. to, you know, 24 with the sure. extension or something. Um, I don't think my room is capable below 28. So it's like, okay. that's good enough. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. And they're, I'm very happy with them. Oh yeah. The reason... The way I found them was actually I was really interested in getting the B&W 802s, like okay. so one part of that line, because okay. that's like kind of the quintessential mastering speaker. Okay. And I'd, I'd heard them before, and the newer versions have some weirdness in the highs. It's like right. kind of hard to explain. Right. But I feel like I'd be making some wonky decisions, but the older ones, the Matrix series from like the 80s are like pretty cheap because people are like, oh, they're old, yeah. you know, so yeah, they yeah. must not be good anymore or yeah. something, you know. Um, so I was looking for those, and then I kept running into people saying that they got rid of their super expensive BMW 802s because they heard these. And these were like, I don't know, half the price or whatever. Wow. And I'm like, okay, well, even if they're not as good, they're close enough that like some pretty decent mastering dudes are saying I like them better. I'm yeah. like, at half the price? And they look super slick. Totally. And I'm into like esoteric gear. Like I don't like buying the stuff everybody gets. Yeah, so I'm just right. like, Well, it's sold. also when you're trying to, when you're running a business and you're trying to differentiate yourself from all these people online mm -hmm. and you're getting sent files digitally. So you're getting sent files globally. Like it's, you know, it's nice that you have, a, you're probably, I uh, think you are the only one in, in the city. I don't even know anyone in Toronto has these. Mm -hmm. So you're definitely, you know, set you apart yeah. in that way. That is really cool. So you found them through mastering people. How yeah. do, how do you buy monitors, especially at this price and at this level, without hearing them? Well, that was part of the risk. Yeah. And because uh, I had heard the 802s, like in all their incarnations, or yeah. most of them, and I knew what I was getting myself into. And it was, this was mostly like talking to some of these guys, talking to Tyler, calling him up. Yeah. Right. And man, like, I don't want to say this because I don't want to represent him like this is his official policy. Yeah. But he said some things to me that were like, if you don't like him, you can send him back. <laughs> and then another one was like, he's like, oh, uh, you can pay for insurance on these, but I'll be honest, it's a waste of money. If they get destroyed in transit, I'll just build another pair and send them up. Oh like, this is the kind gosh. of guy he is. I'm just wow. like, all right, dude, like, yeah, yeah. like because he knows he's he's in a real niche market, yeah. not everybody's got like, you know, six, $7,000 to spend on a pair of speakers I love that, that they're not, not always gonna be able to drive down to, or no, he's in Kentucky oh, okay. to hear them. So he's just like, you know what? If you don't like him, send him back. And I'm yeah. like, has anybody sent them back? And he's yeah. like, only to upgrade to a better version. <laughs> <laughs> So. Well, Kentucky is 10 hour drive. That yeah. might have been worth it. It could have been, yeah. It'd be fun. It'd be fun to check out his fat his like space It'd be fun to pick him up too. too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, that's incredible. And so what about an amp? Did he recommend an amp or did like how did you pick one of one of, one of the things that he takes pride in is uh, is making easy to drive speakers, okay. and that was one of the downsides right. of the of the BMW ones as well. Right. Like, was I was looking at spending another like five grand on an amp, oh, according to the sure, sure. you know yeah, yeah. what people say about yeah. things. You need a lot of current and all that stuff. Yeah. So uh, I'm just using a Rotel amp from like the mid '90s. Okay. That's always done me well. Okay, cool. And um, yeah, it seems to work great. It's quiet and even. so you have these um ungodly akg headphones that are just like i actually got a, a pair of the apple airpods you know the okay. bluetooth yeah. ones <laughs> i love these things and uh i i love how convenient they are but like now that i have a pair of 200 dollar tiny little headphones i'm yeah. like terrified where i put them so oh, yeah you you have this expensive pair of headphones i would mm -hmm. not want to have those but how, how do you, how do those, like what role do those play now that you have these? Um, they're still super useful and I, I was worried they'd be redundant. Yeah. But, um, so these, these speakers are really unforgiving mm -hmm. and uh, they're great, especially in the low end and the mids. Yeah. And the, getting the, getting the high frequency balance in with the mids and, and the low end is like, is very easy with them. Right. But the thing about the AKGs is the AKG sound is, house sound is pretty bright. Okay. And um, sibilance is like, if you get it, 
right on the line yeah. of acceptability, like it's going to be too sil- sibilant, yeah. then they're just like sound like unlistenable. Oh, okay. Right? So I can, they're really good for checking that. Like yeah. if I'm worried about it, I'll be like, listen, this big, I think it sounds good. Yeah, yeah. I'll check on here. Yeah. Right? So I'll check on there and I'll be like, they still sound good on here, right. then it's good. Oh, that's great. And then also like doing tops and tails, fades, yeah. all that stuff, little edits, listening for pops and clicks, like just having a set of cans on your head is like irreplaceable but i mean in this room dead quiet Mm -hmm. you can still hear that i still can and sometimes it's just checking i'll be like oh i think i hear something distorting a little bit let me see and i'll be like yes right yeah no that's usually it's just like a verification thing so i mean i don't know if we talked about this in the last mastering thing and we're going to get to the gear here folks relax but um (laughs) what are like you're listening we got to listen to some tracks before we started rolling here you're listening in probably one of the best environments in the world, like you know, or the way that people can listen to music. Mm-hmm. And then you're sending it off to Joe Blow somewhere on the other side of the world, and he's listening through a $20 Bluetooth mono yeah. speaker. How, how do you reconcile that? How do you instruct your clients to make sure they listen on a good set of headphones? Like, How do you have some sort of control over that? You don't. You just hope for the best. Um, yeah. I had one guy who I'm pretty sure from his feedback was listening to like Beats by Dre, yeah. like just with the bass, just like super out of control. Right. And right. I had, I had yeah. actually like, and um, this was the piano guy I was talking about okay, actually. Yeah. Amazing musician. And yeah. he even self, he's like, I think these headphones have way too much bass. <laughs> because at one point I was like, listen, man, I'm like, I'm high passing this at 100 hertz, right. and you're talking about subs being right. loud. Right. I'm like, just it's piano, like there's almost no subs happening. Yeah. I've, and he's like, yeah, I think I gotta figure something else out. Oh my gosh. So, but then, anyways, we finished the record this yeah. week, and and he sent me some mixes. They sounded awesome. So, that's yeah, funny. It's, it's kind of like just talking about that. But one of the biggest things, and this is like, this is very frustrating for me because it's hard to communicate to people. Uh, and you don't want to you you don't want to be like putting their space down or right. anything. You don't yeah, want to say that, sure. and it's like, and I don't want to be like, oh, my space is better, my speakers sure. are better, and you don't want to give that vibe off at all. But everybody wants their studio space to be their reference space. Right. But the problem is, a lot of the times, I'm fixing stuff that's happened because their space isn't perfect, uh, especially in the low end. So yeah, like, yeah. so I'll be fixing systematic mistakes that they've made because of their space or their monitoring right. and then they're listening back and they're like why'd you take out 200 hertz and be like because 200 hertz was out of control on that <laughs> track do you know what i mean right, right and it's like maybe you should look at this but it's like a tough kind of conversation to broach. Yeah. so maybe in advance i'll try and say like make sure that you right. listen sure listen to it in your own studio but make sure you're listening elsewhere right re- referencing yeah. other tracks like yeah. You know. Well, that's really interesting, and that that's got to be a tough part of your job, I think. Mm-hmm. I had a, I had somebody talking to me about how something that we were working on was peaking, and they were listening on a, one of those pills, Beats. Pill, oh yeah, right. You know, like the mono Bluetooth things, and it's like it was distorting on everything. Right. And the exact same thing. I was like, do you mind like listening to something else on that pill? Mm-hmm. And so, sure enough, just puts on another track, was also distorted. Yeah. I was like, throw it in the garbage. It's broken. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's not me. It's broken. <laughs> yeah. But that's tough. Yeah. I remember back in the day, somebody said to me, and I may have even said this before, but somebody was listening to a mix, and they're like, there's just not enough low end. You got to turn the bass up, turn the kick off. And they were mm-hmm. listening on MacBook speakers. Right. Like, just their laptop. You yeah. Know? Like, before even the MacBook <laughs> speakers were, like, semi-decent today. Yeah. Like. Like take a step back, think about what <laughs> yeah. you're doing. Don't worry, they're magnetic. Sorry, guys. <laughs> this is over. It's a great chance for you to see the drivers. Oh, yeah. It? That's that was the segue. Yeah. This, to me, knock them off. Why, why do you have these on? It's because you have kids, probably. But um, wh- actually, oh, that's so big, beautiful. Exactly the reason. Yeah. My yeah. son goes. My son comes <laughs> in and goes. Meh. I know. Yeah. yeah. And they, it's great. One of the best things about working from home is that I can see my family, like. On the regular, right? And so I have yeah. a, I have two doors on the out, on here, and the kids know if the outside door is open, they can come and visit me. Ah. So they'll just come in. My daughter comes in and she draws and colors on the floor while I'm working, you know, and like yeah, colors on the speakers. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My son's yeah. like two. Sometimes he comes and he's like, "Daddy, you would turn down the music." I'm like, "You gotta leave, man. Like I'm working." <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's so funny. And they're magnetic, eh? Yeah, they just it's nice so you don't have those ugly holes here. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, John, and so this is a really unique setup. And like, what what was the thinking here? Like, this is really unique, and I mean, I love it. I think it's great. But what was the thinking here? Um, well, 
The one thing I wanted to avoid, especially getting nice speakers and try to set them up, is I, I'm really not a big fan of having stuff in the way of the sound. Right. So I didn't want to get like the typical like you know desk slash console in front of me okay. um, that could cause a whole bunch of problems. Okay. So I wanted to make sure my gear was out of the way. I also wanted to make it nice and ergonomic. Yeah, it's right? you're never leaving the middle. Yeah, so yeah. I, I just sit there and you know sometimes I need to do two hands at once, but most of the stuff works pretty well. Like most of it's mid-side as well, so doing yeah. like stereo changes isn't right. super necessary. And um, yeah, so my primary concern was not having the sound interfered with by my gear. And the second was ergonomics. And the third one was, I thought it looked super cool. It does. <laughs> it does. And this is like a little bit of an Ikea hack. Is oh, that it's right? A, it's a mega Ikea hack. We, we got the lack table, which is like 10 bucks. <laughs> and I got um, like shelving brackets, which were like $2 each. And then everybody knows about the Rast. Uh, yeah, well, we were um, we were at uh, Copper Sound in Guelph. I mm -hmm. think it's Copper Sound, and he had, I think it was these or like something, or it was like a side yeah, table. It was an old, old that side table. It's an old side table that they don't sell anymore, and mm -hmm. he filled it full of rock sole. And oh then yeah. Put like a cover on it. It was beautiful, like mm -hmm. a beautiful little bass trap. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, okay, and it's actually, and you're confident with it holding. All your yep. big, heavy, expensive and I mean, gear. it doesn't sound as good as like an eight hundred dollar rack, but like <laughs> you know, one day I'll upgrade. One you day, know, I'll upgrade nope, that's sound. fair. That's fair. You know, IKEA stuff actually sounds pretty good. I can't. They actually discontinued this when I when I bought this. It was the last one I could find in Ontario, and I was super upset no way. because, like, for like I don't know, has it been decades? People have been make, doing the Rast hack for their yeah. studios, and this is exactly nineteen inches. Yeah, it's perfect. It's like, it's, I thought they designed it Wait, for this did application. You, is it exactly like this many units as well? Yeah, so the way it comes, you can fit six units. And then if you just drill extra holes, so see, you can see the factory holes. Yeah. You just drill another set of holes, you can get eight. So that has got to be not a coincidence. I know, right? It has, like, it has to be some, intentional. Some Swedish, maybe we'll, if, if anyone from head office is watching this um, in Sweden, uh, then please call in. But like seriously, 19 inches across, and that I mean that is absurd. And we're talking it's like perfect. <laughs> I there's no way you could design it this perfect. To yeah. Fit that. And 19 inches seems like a pretty arbitrary. Yeah, it's width. true. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. No, no, not 20. 19. 19. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's all the time we have here. We can't talk about the gear. So I, I, I've said before, and I want to ask you about your process um, because, because of the way things are laid out. And, and you are still 100% analog aside mm -hmm. from yeah, unless when somebody you wants, receive the tracks. Yeah, the only time that I, I go in the box is if uh, somebody wants them really loud. Okay. Um, so like the, the pendulum limiter works really well okay. uh, for like anything reasonable. Yeah. If somebody wants it up to like minus seven LUFS right. or something like that, I'll just, I'll throw some more digital limiting. Oh, in okay. If okay that bothers, like, and I'll even tell them, well, now it's not all analog anymore. And everybody's like, I don't care. Like, <laughs> I want what, it loud. What about like, are, are you ever using effects? Do you ever throw reverb on anything? Or? No, pretty no. much never. Um, okay. So we'll talk about the IGS because that's new. Mm -hmm. um, and again, for the people watching, we have a previous video where we dive into this significantly yeah. as well as this. Mm -hmm. And this is a unit you built, yeah. right? Um, and this is an extremely rare unit. And if it wasn't a million and a half dollars, I would buy one just for the look of it. Yeah, it was. Um, not literally a million and a half. It's no, like a, a million and a quarter. <laughs> 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 Just kidding. Okay, so, so you get the wave yeah. um, from from somewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And then what's the process? So um, I have like a, a basic loudness that I use. So it's a combination of peak and like the RMS that I want to feed out to my gear. Okay. Um, just because I've, I've kind of found like my workflow with the gain staging and everything. And it's super easy to manipulate that in the box. Right, right. So I kind of just like hit a target. Mostly it's an ear thing okay. and I can see how the meters are going. And then uh, the Apogee converts it to analog. Okay. And my workflow is literally like this. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, with the limiter at the end. Okay, that yeah. is really cool. So this is, just walk us through really quickly. This is a... This is the, well, it's the infundibulum. It's kind of a one of a kind. Yeah. It's, it's like part multiband compressor, part soft clipper, part dynamic EQ, okay. all in one. And it uses transformers primarily to change. Yes, and I remember you saying that it has no power. Yeah, it's totally passive, which is awesome. So insane. Yeah, it's like a 
It's so insane. Physics it, nerds dream. It's nice because though it, it does keep things not so hot in here. Yes. If this had to power on, we'd, <laughs> we'd set fire to this unit here. Um, and so what, I mean, you must have thought a lot about this. Yeah, process. and th this is a hard one because, because it does have like these soft clipping properties. A lot of guys will actually, well, the guys that have them anyways, yeah. will put them at the end. All 20 of them. <laughs> um, yeah, so they'll, they'll kind of put them at the end. Okay. Um, but I personally find it is kind of like my, instead of trying to use it as a loudness tool, which some guys will use it as, yeah. I prefer to use it as kind of like a corrective tool. Okay. So it's kind of like there's certain problems that are very, hard to fix yeah. uh, like sibilance and stuff that right. this is good at and uh, even um like kick drums that are too punchy it's really good at that kind oh, of wow. too and the proximity effect on vocals it's like it's magic on it like nothing works like this does right? so i don't understand but anyways um so it just to me it made more sense to have it at the beginning because then if i can get rid of these tricky problems at the start now my eq is being used for like eqing not dynamic problem solving. Right. So, you, you know, you might end up with some of those issues and be tempted to use EQ, but I'm like, no, I'll, I'll see if I can deal with, with it here. And that's then really cool. I can use my EQs for... That's, that's quite that's quite smart. Uh, and so then we have a very elaborate EQ here. Yeah. This is like the main, this is kind of like my main event. I probably spend my most time here. Small tweaks to the EQ. I imagine. Very can clean. You, can you uh, recite the company and model of this? Um, yeah, this is, this is a kit that you can get from DIY Racked. Okay. And it's based on the Sontech... He says it's like the 250EX circuit, which is the same as the 432, uh, 432? Anyways, there's a, there's a mastering version too that has all switches. Okay. Same circuit, yeah. the mastering version's all switched. The 250EX is actually all potentiometers. Okay. So I don't know why he would say it's that circuit when it's the same one but switched, and this is all switched. Okay. So anyways, that's how it is. But there's an additional mid-side matrix added, and also per-band bypass, which is the handiest thing in the world right, instead of yes. taking the whole eq you, out you're just like i remember you told me that before yeah. that's amazing um okay so now we're 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 flip-flopped over here and i think you had this last time we were here right yep and so what's the difference why why the two eqs at one after another um so this one is more of a broad strokes kind of thing okay and we talk about it in the first video right quite a bit okay too. so i'm when i'm eqing here I'll have to watch that yeah <laughs> I'm kind of bouncing between them because this is the one that's like, uh, it needs more mids. Uh, Do you know I what see, I mean? So I'm I like, see. more okay. mids, and I find okay. the this, this spot, and this is more like the little finicky. Surgical yeah. feel. Okay, yeah. cool. And then I remember you telling me this is like a stereo LA-2A. Is that right? Or? Kind of, yeah. It's an optical compressor. Right. Okay. It's, it's not yeah. like LA-2A's tube. Um, yeah. This is a solid state. It's nice okay. and clean. And this is very like... Uh, oh, and this had all the different options. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Those are basically just like the attack and release constants. Right, okay. And... Uh, yeah, so this is very clean, and it's kind of like, it's one of those things that's almost kind of boring because it just does its job so well. Sure. Entry in a mastering world, that means like not being right. able to hear it, right. you know? Okay. So, um, but it's, what I, the way I describe it is it's like the ultimate engineer's finger. So imagine you're like automating, like they used to do in the old days by actually like riding yeah. the fader. Yeah. Like the way it moves, the way it does all that stuff, it's just like, that's what it's like. It's very perfect. And nice. it can go fast, yeah. but it still has that feel of just like this nice smooth, like just riding the, the right. sound, you know what I mean? So you have different compressor type options. Mm -hmm. The VCA, what would that be modeling? Um, that's kind of like your SSL, SSL type okay. thing. And yeah. Is that where you usually use it? Uh, yeah, most okay. of the time. It's very linear, very predictable. It just right. kind of like compresses. Okay, yeah. cool. And then it's usually between VCA and Greenbox. Greenbox is more like the LA-2A style thing. That's nice and slow. Um, what is Greenbox? What is that? Um, that's, so the guy Meek? made this. Yeah, so he's right. the guy who right. invented the original Joe Meek line. Wow. And the SC2 is his most famous compressor, and that's basically the SC2. Okay, I think we maybe have seen one of those before. Mm -hmm. It's a great, great unit, great looking unit. And and one of the things I love about your studio is that we've never seen most of this stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, just not even close like um and that i think that's so cool and it's like what we talked about with the monitors is like you know when you're offering your services to people here in our community the music mm -hmm. community there's no other studios that have this gear and that can can do some of the stuff that you can do i mm -hmm. think that's really cool okay remind me What's about that one called we didn't you didn't mention the uh part name for that and people on the internet will yell at you. Oh, this oh, one. This. Yeah, it's the t TF Pro is the company for both of these. This is the P9 and this is the P38EX, which is basically like his most tricked out compressor that he ever made. And we do go into quite detail on episode one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The prequel. Um, okay, so IGS, remind me, um, 
Remind me about who these guys are, because I, I'm confused. Yeah, they're a Polish company. Okay. Um, they've kind of emerged in the past ten years, I guess. Okay. And uh, their their kind of claim to fame at first was just like rip off things. So they did some good like Paltech kind of copies oh, okay. and stuff like okay. that. Then they started going into their their original designs, um, which are pretty good. Yeah. Um, I. One of the reasons I was looking for a very mu, and one of the things that I liked about this is that it does have mid side, it does have wet dry control. Very rare oh, to find wow. in a very mu yeah. kind of thing, especially because I wanted something like uh, the most of the very mu compressors are famous for being able to drive them into saturation a bit. Right. And so, if, as a mastering engineer, it's great to be like, "That's the sound I want." Now let's dial it back. Sure. Right. Like yeah, that's super totally. handy. That is really cool. Um, yeah, and this stuff like that too. It's very nice. Yeah, and the ergonomics of this thing are just great. Like I don't even have to look at it. I can just be like attack, okay. You know, yeah. keep my head centered. Yeah. And I love that about it. Is it noisy at all? No. Wow. It's actually very quiet. Is it four mastering or yeah, were people absolutely. Yeah. He says oh, says two poor mastering, mastering edition. edition, but there is no other. Oh no, there's the five hundred series one. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And is it it's still in production? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to look them up because I I was looking at a company recently and Oh, do you know Jamie Barnes' stuff, yes, right? Yeah. He has a, I believe it's a compressor in a 500 series that's like military green. Do you know who? What, what oh, is that, that like models? a retro instruments thing? It's not retro oh. instruments. Oh. And it, it it has that, like the meter, like some of the API ones, where it's like a vertical meter. Um, I, we'll have to look it up. I feel like I know what you're but talking. I, I know the look it of it. It might be an IGS. Yeah. Is it a compressor? Yeah, anyway. Whatever. Okay, so then our last step here. This this wasn't in our, our last video. Actually, you know what? I want to bring something back to this. You can. Um, because it was one of the one of the reasons why I was so interested in it. Yeah. And I'm sure if we tag this or whatever in the video and people, there's not a lot we of will. good information on this. Um, this will accept four different kinds of tubes for the compression. Oh. And I got all of them, including the like super expensive ones that they use in the Fairchild 670. No oh, way. Right. And um, not the... You got to watch out though, because the circuit's optimized for um, basically like two sets of the tubes I found. Okay. And so the the other ones sound good, but the range like I could be riding the gain, the input gain, like down here on one of them, and then yes. the other one's like way cranked. Wow. And the so the the Fairchild tubes, which are quite a chunk of change to buy, was yeah. like three fifty for a pair. Wow. Um, uh, they didn't work very well in there. Wow. Um, I couldn't get it to, I was really stoked on it first because they sound yeah. awesome. The sound of them is amazing, but yeah. I couldn't get the thing to compress even like one dB. No way. Which is like, people are like, oh yeah, I'm mastering, you're only tagging yeah. one dB anyways. But when I buy a nice piece of gear, sure. I want you I want, want to be able to <laughs> if I want to. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So just a note for all the people out there that are getting this, it sounds great. I use yeah. the, six, the 6C B8 tubes. I, okay. I find sound the best. That's awesome. But the the Fairchild ones is like, if you want a Fairchild, maybe you should you just see build the, a clone. Yeah, I'm not going to say buy one. <laughs> Stam, Stam Audio has just released a, a clone oh, for yeah. like five or six thousand bucks. No way. Yeah. The parts alone to build one of those things is like almost three grand Canadian. Yeah, so. well, I don't know how he's, I, I'm excited for people to hear it because yeah. everyone loves his, you know, his SSL compressor and his LA2A and everything. Yeah. So. Uh, so the this here, just tell me about that. So that's the Pendulum PL2. It's a brick wall limiter. Okay. It's all analog. Yeah. Um, and it does limiting. So okay. I, that's basically like my yeah. last loudness thing. I'm curious about what role does this play after this? Like what is this doing at the very la second to last stage? These three, it really depends on the material. Um, okay. So, so sometimes when I do make a change in the order, it'll actually be putting the pendulum before the tube core. Okay. Because I um, sometimes, like because it's tube and sometimes you're like riding it hot. Yeah. Um, when when this thing overloads, if there's like a kick that's too loud, it'll actually distort. Okay. But then this thing is really good at transparently taking care of that. So if I find that that's happening, I'll just go in the back and I'll switch them. Oh, and then okay. this will like lop that extra transient off clean. Oh. And then this will do its thing so, better. So let me ask you then, This is these aren't all individual hardware inserts? Are, no. are they wired into each other? Yeah, they're all in series. Oh my The idea gosh. of like doing eight Analog to digital conversions. Right. Uh, ew, that's like, that gives me the heebie jeebies. Good I don't point. care. It's like, it could be the best converters yeah. in the world. It still makes me super nervous. I never even thought of that, how yeah. many times it would go out. That's a great point. So they're, they're all just going into each other. Yeah. That's a lot of cables. It is. Yeah. Speaking of cables, go on. Um, one of the like, most, I want, this is my super cynical thing about the audiophile world. And you know okay. I'm into audiophile. Like, no, yes, I know. I'm excited for this. We haven't never talked about cables. Oh, okay. Oh, so you know those cables, you can get like a two foot interconnect that's like 
twelve grand or something like that, right? You can buy a twelve thousand dollar cable. Yes, you can. Okay. And like it'll be like two feet, and that's like one of the two. In okay, the I did pair. not know that. Okay, I'm not in that world. So yeah, so <laughs> like, I think that I think that I have like fairly good ears when it comes to music. I'm sure there's people that have better ears than yeah. me and stuff, right? But so this unit that I built, okay, yeah. I like I'll just take the thing out. I'll have everything flat. I'll take it out, put it in, and I'll listen as hard as I can, and I just can't hear any difference. Right. Okay. Not even including the circuit trace in this thing, the just the wire that I use to wire up the switches to the board is like a hundred feet of wire, like per channel. No way. It was like so much length of wire. Yeah. And you know, you know how much I bought that for? It was like fifteen dollars for like a hundred feet. <laughs> okay. So the question is, if like maybe there's a difference, yeah. maybe. Yeah. But like I'm mastering with something that's like considered a good piece of gear on like high end monitoring in a good room, and Inside I cannot hear in there anything. Is feet How can of wire. two feet wow. between like if I put wow. if I put a twelve thousand dollar interconnect between these two things yeah. is now suddenly like the problem of wire go away? Right. Like it's just like I can't. There's some really things that I believe in. Yeah. I cannot get behind that yeah. one at all. <laughs> interesting. So you just have normal cables then going in between these? Yep, yeah, just XLR cables. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's refreshing to hear because I have. Um, my twelve thousand dollar cables come from Amazon, so <laughs> you bought twelve thousand of them, though, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right, six thousand actually. But yes, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, I had no clue that that you had them going into each other, but I mean that makes sense. I never even thought of that about the the digital thing. Man, that's so smart. Um, behind you, and and we're I think we're almost done here. This yeah. has been tons of fun. Um, what's going on behind here? So these are um, these are another interesting kind of acoustic solution. Did Jay just get sick of doing the random? Yeah, <laughs> he was work. charging for whole. So this is, have you heard of Helmholtz resonator? I have. Yeah. Before. Yeah. So they're um, they're typically like in like a kind of bottle or vase shape kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, but this is a, a spinoff on that, and it's kind of like a sealed chamber that has um, these holes. They're kind of like the neck of the of the Helmholtz resonator and okay. then the inside is like a body. Okay. And so this is this is really good for attacking a specific frequency that's out of control. So mm -hmm. in this case it was 150 hertz wow. for this room. And um, I actually probably could have used another pair of them to perfectly solve it, okay. that problem. So it only got about halfway there. Um, but the thing is, so Roxel yeah. uh, say is like pretty good at absorbing at, at a two inch depth let's say is really good at absorbing down to about 250 to 200 hertz. Okay. But getting below that, it just stops working. Right. But the really interesting thing is if you take this approach, now it can start absorbing a lot of sound at those lower frequencies. Wow. And so you can take this like, um, so the whole, the, the thickness of the material, the width of the hole and the spacing of the hole and, and then the depth of it, there's four kind of like uh, factors to that equation that you have to get the frequency right. Wow. Um, but in the same size panel, which would do almost nothing at say like 100 hertz, you can actually start taking care of 100 hertz pretty effectively. Wow. The only drawback is this is this is like everything above 200 hertz, like yeah, right, yeah. take it up. Yeah. This is like only that oh, spot, only okay. that frequency. Okay. So you have to do measurements before you kind of decide what you're going to do with that. So what's, this wood looks different than the size, is it? Is it different or is it just? No, oh, it's not okay. different. It's okay. probably just me being really bad at staining wood. I'm just going to be <laughs> <Sorry>. honest. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, no, I just, I thought it looked like, no, it's fine. Yeah. That's right. Um, so I'm insulting you so much here. That's so, fine, man. Um, I, got, what? <laughs> I try to be the least pretentious person I can. So. I'm here for the gear, man. I'm here for the gear. Yeah. Okay. So what's behind, what's behind this then? Uh, How thick is this? That's uh inch and a half depth actually. Okay. For that one. Yeah. Um, and then Roxel again. And then yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. So it's just the, the holes and the spacing of mm -hmm. the holes. Wow. I'm going to get you to come by to my place and give me some advice. Is that yeah. okay? Oh, yeah. For sure. It's only $300 an hour <laughs> for consulting. No, I'm just kidding. It's part of the, it's part of the video. <laughs> yeah. It's part of the interview. I'll just do it again. Gay. <laughs> and this already. is just uh, the Roxel still, right? That we yep. see. Yeah, okay. that's more broadband just because I'm sitting there and I don't want it bouncing off the wall behind Awesome. Me. Well, it's great. Thanks so much for having us back. Thanks for coming uh, back. This is. I'm so glad we got to do this, and uh, and congratulations on the new space. It's Thank like, you. It's great. It's awesome. I want to listen to some more music. Yeah. All right. Come Thanks, John. Soon. Thanks, Jay. <laughs>